Bills defender Dane Jackson was taken to the hospital to be evaluated for a neck injury after this concerning play. Welcome back everybody, I'm Dr. Brian Suter, and if you're new here and wanna learn about injury mechanisms and sort of the underlying anatomy and what the medical provider is doing on the field, then be sure and subscribe to my channel and let me know down below what you learned as you watch this video. Jackson has been taken to the hospital for more evaluation, but reportedly does have movement in his extremities. What happened on this play, unfortunately, is a severe amount of forced hyperextension of Jackson's neck. So when we talk about neck motion, the act of your neck bending backwards and looking up towards the ceiling is neck or cervical extension, and looking down with your chin towards your chest is cervical flexion. So here, as the other Bills player comes in and hits Jackson's helmet, he gets forced into an excessive amount of hyperextension, which can not only stress the vertebra, the bony structures of the spine, but also the spinal cord and the neurologic structures themselves. One thing to keep an eye on from this angle is we can see the other Bills player's right arm almost looks like it potentially gets up underneath Jackson's helmet, potentially contacting the side of Jackson's neck, which could have some implications with what can happen in this type of a mechanism. And because of that, we also see a little bit of rotation and kind of bending to the right with Jackson's neck as this play kind of continues through. So we have a combination of some forced hyperextension with a little bit of rotation of his cervical spine as well. Right away, it was great that we could see Jackson moving and at least having some gross motor function. I want to highlight right off the bat too, excellent job by the Bills medical staff getting out here. You can see as soon as this one provider gets out onto the field, what does he do? He goes right to the cervical spine. He's got both of his hands up underneath the helmet, stabilizing that cervical spine. The person who's at the head in these situations is technically in charge of this whole ordeal. They have cervical spine. That's the most concerning thing here is of course a spinal cord injury. And so this medical provider on the team, both of his hands are up underneath the helmet, sort of on the skin of his neck as best as possible to stabilize that cervical spine as best as he can. Because what you're worried about in this situation when you get out there, stabilize that spine, you're worried about a spinal cord injury. So mad props to the medical providers here for recognizing that. Sometimes we don't see the play happen, we might not see footage of what occurred, and it takes a little bit of time of the player moving around before we realize, oh, cervical spine, I gotta stabilize it. Right away, they were right on it, got to the cervical spine, and other providers are out there to help them with this whole sequence. Let's review the anatomy here with our biodigital anatomy tool and understand more about the possibilities with what can happen. The first thing, of course, we need to talk about are the actual bones of the cervical spine, the cervical vertebrae. That's going to be one of the primary passive stabilizers to prevent excessive neck motion. Whenever you bend your neck backwards into extreme extension, that's gonna be going in this direction. And there's a couple of things that are acting along the way to stop it from going further. Number one, the spinous processes, which are the little bumps, the kind of protrusions here in the back of the vertebral bodies, could potentially get close enough to where they would contact one another. But you also have these joints called the facet joints. These are the little joints that sit right here between those two cervical vertebrae. And those are going to also prevent excessive hyperextension. In the front of the vertebral bodies, you have a big long ligament called the anterior longitudinal ligament. Anterior because it's in the front of the cervical column, longitudinal because it's going up and down, and ligament because it's connecting the bones. Obviously, whenever you bend your head backwards into extension, you're going to put that ALL under extreme tension. So sometimes we'll see more of a strain, a sprain, you know, these ligament types of injuries because of stretch on that ALL. Other things in this area, of course, that we worry about are going to be the spinal cord. Now, Sometimes you can have a fracture of the vertebral column and one of these bony fragments can go in and injure, damage, basically cut the spinal cord. But sometimes the spinal cord can just become stretched. There's something we call central cord syndrome. It's very common in older people who fall or if you have a car accident, have a whiplash type of injury where the spinal cord can just become sort of bruised. Typically when that happens, people will have more issues with fine motor control of their hands. They'll have issues maybe with their bladder control as opposed to big gross motor paralysis. So central cord syndrome, definitely something we think about whenever we see these extreme sort of hyperextensions, almost like whiplash mechanisms. The other thing that can get compromised with any of these extreme neck movements are going to be these nerve roots. So the nerve roots come out of the vertebral bodies through these little tiny holes called foramen. It's how you get from inside the column to the rest of the body. Whenever you bend your neck in extreme ways, you can bring those two ends of the bones closer together and potentially cause impingement or pinching of these nerve roots. The other thing to know is that the brachial plexus, of course, is the group of nerves that is going to come off of those nerve roots 
and go down into the arm. We hear about things like stingers, where you can have a temporary stun of that brachial plexus from either a direct trauma or some sort of tension or compression on this group of structures, typically affecting more of the nerves kind of higher up, C5, C6 in particular, with strength and motor function to more muscle groups like the shoulder. I mentioned that right arm of the other Bills player because potentially if that arm does get underneath the helmet and strike Jackson directly on the neck, you could strike that brachial plexus and you could be talking about something that's more like a stinger with those peripheral nerves being injured as opposed to something truly central in the spinal cord. But stingers can also happen from tension just like they can happen from compression. And so any of the twisting that we see with the neck hyperextended can also lead to something more like a stinger. Stingers aren't always benign though. Of course, remember what happened with Inky Johnson, thought it looked like just a regular stinger, but he had injury to the blood vessel that lies behind those nerves, resulting in complete paralysis essentially of his arm. So that's really what you need to get to the hospital for, even if it's something just like a stinger, where there's truly a higher level of concern for a more serious underlying injury. When we get on the field in a situation like this, what we're running through is basically our trauma algorithm, A, B, C, D, E. We start with the airway, then go on to breathing and circulation, because while the spinal cord injury potential is there in a serious, something that compromises your airway, your breathing, or your blood flow is going to be more serious initially than that spinal cord injury. So out here in this situation, of course, if they're conscious, if they're coherent, you don't really have to worry as much about circulation, airway, and breathing, but certainly that's the first thing on our minds when we get out here on the field. Then we get onto D, which is disability. So that's where we're looking for that sign of a spinal cord injury. We're looking for tenderness along the neck. We're looking for gross motor function of the hands, of the legs, potentially checking neck movement. But in this situation, if there's any of those concerns, you're not even going to allow the athlete to move their neck. So we basically walk through a progression of more and more complex neurologic evaluation if everything checks out along the way. But if anything is concerning or bad, that's when we assume there could be a spinal cord injury, get them on the backboard, get them to the hospital. E is an environmental, so things like any exposures, you know, cold, burns, that sort of thing that could also be explaining why somebody might be down in a sort of trauma situation. Putting all this together in summary here with the anatomy model and the play, of course, when the other Bills player comes in, what happens to Jackson is a forced hyperextension of his cervical spine. What that's going to do is potentially put some compressive load on these posterior elements, the facet joints, the spinous processes. That's going to put some tension on the anterior elements like the ALL, potentially causing some transient spinal cord bruising, potentially some nerve injury. But then there's also a possible component here of some rotation of the cervical spine and maybe some direct contact through the neck. For the evaluation, the CT scan is gonna give the best detail of the bones, and you'll only hear about them doing something like an MRI if there's concern for damage to the spinal cord or the nerve. So if we don't hear anything about an MRI, that certainly is a good sign, of course, in these situations. Always have to be thinking about a concussion, we have to be thinking about the blood vessels, we have to be thinking about all those other injuries beyond just the bones and the nerves, because as we've seen in previous athletes, all that stuff can play a role. That's it for the video, everybody. I hope this was educational to look at some anatomy, talk about how this situation is handled on the field, and hopefully you learn something along the way. Let me know as always any questions or comments down below, and until next time, we'll see you later.